Anne Beaumont, please. Does the government have any teeth when it comes to the inappropriate sexualisation of children? There was a report this week on the sexualisation of young children called Letting Children Be Children. Jermaine Greer. If you uh, think about this phenomenon, you have to ask yourself where it really comes from. Um, who is it? When is it that our children are sexualised? Um, for years and years, 20 years, it's been impossible to buy clothes for little girls that didn't dress them as little tarts, that didn't have um, sequins on their jeans, that weren't Jordan pink or Katie Price pink. Um, and it became a strange thing that little girls screamed and yelled. They wanted these things. It became like a sort of guerrilla uniform for little girls saying, I am feminine, I'm a girly, I'm a girly girl. I don't, I don't pretend to understand exactly where this came from. I would even entertain the possibility that they were reacting against a particular kind of feminism that said you've got to be, you know, boyish and tough and, and not be coy and manipulative and so on. It was extremely depressing for an old feminist like me to watch this phenomenon. But it just grew and grew and the more mothers said, I will not buy you your 25th Barbie doll, the more screaming and yelling there was until the 25th Barbie doll was got. So there's always been this sinister culture that has gone along and it's always been sexual. The Barbie doll herself is a fetish. She is descended from a sex toy. Little girls learn to flirt with their fathers, you know, kiss daddy goodnight and all this sort of business. Um, and you wonder whether what's happening in marketing is a response to this or whether it's actually causing it. And in fact, by now, it's become biofeedback. One feeds the other. All you can pray for is that it will run out of steam, that the kids themselves will suddenly think, that's so naff, it's so last year, it's so disgusting, that they just won't do it anymore. So the government can't do anything about it? Or, and, and this report the, to the I'll Mother's Union can't do anything about if it? If the government decides to censor what is available, if they decide that certain things are not for little girls, they will actually give them added value. They'll make them more glamorous. So you'd rather they did nothing? Magazines for 12-year-olds are read by 8-year-olds precisely because they're for 12-year-olds. Kids want desperately to grow up. We have to come up with something more substantial. We have to give them an idea of self-worth which goes beyond being flirtatious, goes beyond having the right size bosom age 12, which allows you to actually have a little bit of fat on your thighs, yeah. allows you not to be a dreadful imitation of a Barbie doll. But it's not to be done top down. You don't like top down with the health service. This is mental health service. It's got to come spontaneously okay. from these little people themselves. Excellent. Excellent. Peter Hitchens. Well, where did this sexu sexualization come from exactly? Why is it that we now have this, this Babylon which, which, which even affects small children? And could it conceivably be because we decided back in the 1960s to change our moral climate? This is actually a job for the Archbishop, not for me, it seems to me, that we decided that we were going to stop being a Protestant Christian country which believed that the main form of sexual relationship was lifelong marriage and that we were fairly Puritan about sex and to become instead a post-Lady Chatterley society in which sex was like tennis. It was just something you did, it was pleasure, there were no rules about it and everybody should talk about it all the time, it should be on television the whole time, it should be on the radio the whole time, it should form the lyrics of all the songs that people listen to, which it is. Out of the radio it comes, out of the television it comes, out of the internet it comes, they go to school and they get sex education which is actually all about taking away their, 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 their innocence. And all these forces combine. That's what, 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 else, what, else is the, what else is the purpose of sex education? We're told again and again, again and again, that it's, it's, supposed to stop, it's supposed to stop underage pregnancy, it's supposed to stop sexually transmitted diseases. And what happens? The more sex education we have, the more sexually transmitted diseases. The more abortion, the more underage pregnancy we have. It's demonstrably so. If that, so, so, okay, you're in favour of the sexualisation of children, then we've got that straight. 
<laughs> and indeed, and indeed, you are. Our culture is, and so, uh, and so to stand to stand here after, after 50 years of this and say, oh, let's have a law against against selling padded bras to small children, seems to me to be on the level of futile gesture. Okay. And uh, and the newspapers, of course, play their part. I noticed the mail was described by Ofcom as showing significantly more graphic and close-up material than was on television when there were complaints about. Rihanna being on X Factor. Yeah, well, that was, that was just Ofcom trying to get out of a fix that they were in by, oh, really? by, by blaming somebody else. Yes, they'd let something through which they shouldn't have let through. The and they say they blame the male. I, that's what a lot of people do. That's what the Speaker, of the, House it, of, what the speaker it, of the House of Commons does. It makes them happy, somehow. So the Speaker of the House of Commons describes a sexist, racist, bigoted comic cartoon strip, your group of newspapers. <laughs> I should, I, I should st stress here for a moment, but not because in any way I wish to, to, to disown my sister paper. I work for the Mail on Sunday, not the Daily Mail. I'd be very happy, I'd be very happy to be described in such un uncomplimentary terms by the Speaker. Uh, I, I would take it as a compliment. The, the woman in the third row there. Yeah. Um, there were several problematic things about Bailey's report. Um, one seemed to me to be the absolute absence of actually any research involving children. Yeah, Rich Bailey, people. I should say, is the person who produced this report for the yeah. Others Union, yes. And it seemed to me that children themselves were actually totally absent from this, mm -hmm. and I don't know who's actually talking to children and young people um, about their views about how sexualised our culture is. Um, I think that this kind of moralising tone, creating this bogeyman of the media or a bogeyman of retailers, those people have some responsibility, but if we don't talk about young children how to equip them and empower them to navigate this world. We are doing a massive disservice to young people. Um, and we talk about the government, um, you know, that the government only has so much it can do. And I agree about the censorship stuff, that it's just going to make stuff more appealing. But the government is also, funnily enough, involved in sex education. The sex education that we have in this country is not consistent, is not actually mandatory, and does not cover key issues. Really comprehensive sex education that covers okay. consent, that covers self-esteem, that covers pleasure, that covers desire, that covers gender, and that covers media literacy, would equip young people to better navigate the world we're in, because people are not going to stop trying to sell them stuff. So. Of course, this report, report to the, the government, which the Prime Minister accepted, had 14 recommendations. The man at the back there in the striped shirt, you say. Um, I think that Mr Hitchens' suggestion that uh, if we don't buy into his historically inaccurate and rose-tinted view of pre-60s uh, pre sexual morality we therefore support the exploitation of children. That's a false dichotomy and it doesn't help us get anywhere with resolving the issue. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Um, I'd just like to take exception to what uh, Jermaine Greer said about dressing your children as tarts. I've got two young girls and they're teenagers and my daughters have never been dressed as tarts. And also the coy kissing of daddy before they go to bed. Surely they give me a kiss because they love me. That depends whether a child is being taught to flirt with you rather than simply, oh. I'm sorry. Who's going to teach my children to flirt with me? That, that is an awful thing to say. There are all kinds of ways of kissing your children, but there's one thing I'd like to say here, which is that kids don't have a single culture. They have all different cultures, and schools side by side in the same street can exhibit very different behaviours because it's the way the kids in those schools define themselves. So we have some schools where the girls wear their, their uniforms right down to their ankles and others where they wear them as, hard, as short as they can possibly get them. It's all part of the way they define themselves and they can define themselves in opposition to a prevailing morality. When you're a child, what you're doing is forging your own path. Parents might like to think that their kids want to have sex the way they do. They're almost certainly wrong. But what we have got to understand is how creative kids are and how the development of sexuality has to do with their libido and their creativity. But you did say what offended that father and might offend many other fathers listening that there was something unnatural about girls being told to kiss their father. Have you ever heard me use the word unnatural, David? No, I said, no, I didn't say it. Did you you say just unnatural? said unnatural. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no. no, no. You um, said it was whatever you did say. What did you say? It's, 
It's encouraging girls to be coy and manipulative in the way they approach other people. And that's something that enters right into the culture. Right. And Jessamine. we want our girls to be straightforward with us. We want them to be good chaps. But most of the time, they're being rewarded for a different kind of behaviour. Well, that's, that's, that's how sick we are as a society. Well, that, people, that people actually introduce Jesus. sex into, into, into a good night kiss of the father to the daughter. Je I, Je unbelievable. Je Imagination. Oh, my God. <laughs> agree with the, the lady in the audience in the stripy vest and mm -hmm. I have to say I do disagree with you Peter that, uh, that freedom of information about sex is, is the root of all of this but I do remain very concerned about the sexualization of m much of our culture whether it's the soft porn lads mags next to the pick and mix or the pop videos which almost inevitably have a, a very very slender uh, lady in a skimpy outfit showing lots of cleavage gyrating around. I'm worried about the message that that sends to girls in particular that what's important is the way that you look and it's about that being a sexualized object is what's most important. I'm worried about the consequences and, uh, and somebody said what did children themselves think? Well the NSPCC uh, did a study that revealed that one in six teenage girls from 13 to 17 had been pressurized into sex with their boyfriends. Girl Guiding uh, did a study which looked at younger girls attitudes. Nearly half said that the most negative thing about being a woman was the pressure to feel attractive. I think this is a major problem. Can the government have teeth and solve it all? I, I don't think the government can solve it all. This is a, a very multifaceted problem. It's, it needs government, yes, to be able to regulate where that's necessary. The media does need to take a more responsible view. And it's not just the sexualisation. I mean, even children's television programming, even here in the BBC, 32% of the lead characters are male. Uh, you know, what are these role models that, are we're, that we're putting forward? But Parents and as consumers can have an impact as well. So the campaign Pink Stinks, for example, managed to stop the early learning centre from selling its dressing up clothes where the, where the girls were sold nurses' outfits but the boys were sold doctors' outfits. These stereotypes seep into the consciousness at an early age. Sorry, if the 32% of the heroes are male, what are the other? Sorry, it's only 32% are female. Sorry, I got that the wrong oh, word. It's so a two to one ratio. Yeah, I mean, Dora you the stop. Explorer aside, you're not really finding that many great role models for okay. young women. Whether it's in actually goes all the way back, fairy tales, whatever else. I agree with Germaine. We want to reduce this, this pure sexualization, but you need to replace it with something else for people to aspire right. to. So it's I'll not take, all I'll the I'll take a couple one point of mind. Sex education is not freedom of information. Sex education is propaganda for promiscuity. Oh, right. don't be. Find out what they're teaching. Find out what they're teaching your children. You've made, you've made, you've made, you've made, you've made, you've made that point. Ridiculous. Yeah, like the man in the beard, you know, you make him. Make it again. No, there's no point in making it three times over, because if you make it once, we can, yeah. Jermaine Greer caused a bit of a fuss last night on Question Time with some comments about girls kissing their fathers goodnight. So there's always been this sinister culture that has gone along and it's always been sexual. The Barbie doll herself is a fetish. She is descended from a sex toy. Little girls learn to flirt with their fathers, you know, kiss daddy goodnight and all this sort of business. Um, and you wonder whether what's happening in marketing is a response to this or whether it's actually causing it. Right, Dr. Pat Spongen, Spongen who's a family psychologist. Good morning. Hello. Uh, daughter, daughters kissing their fathers goodnight, is it, is it sexual? Oh, it's nonsense, absolute nonsense. I mean, there's an academic without children theorising in the realms of areas that most people with children would not recognise. I think that daughters and fathers to have a warm, physical, cuddling, loving relationship is only a positive thing for everybody involved. And I loathe this kind of creeping into the family of suspicion and nervousness. You know, should, should fathers bath their babies? Um, should they have baths with their children? Should they kiss them goodnight now? It's absolutely ridiculous. But there's no one, I think, who would really take that seriously, that fathers shouldn't ch kiss their children goodnight, really, honestly, is there? Well, at least one person seems to. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, is there something at all... I might if you took that to its logical conclusion and we, we instigated this sort of cold, loveless world of, vic you know, v Absolutely. Victorianism. You know? Absolutely. You know, fathers shaking hands with their sons as they come back from war this kind of uh, coldness and distance. Now, we've come a long way from that, and a good thing too, and to have it now sort of misinterpreted, um, I just think it's 
I'm surprised at Jimmy, and I've got a lot of time for her. She says some really interesting stuff. Oh, she's done it again in a way, hasn't mm. she? I mean, she's uh, she knows how to stir it up. But again. is there anything at all in the fact that young girls do learn to flirt in the broadest sense of the term with, with men, with older men, with friends, family, and so on? Is there anything in that? You know, it's what, it's what adults see in the way that the child behaves. It's not actually the way that the child themselves interpret it. You know, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old is behaving in a spontaneous warm, loving way. If an adult looks at it and says it's flirting, then I think that's in the eye of the beholder. Thank you very much indeed. Dr Pat Spungen, family psychologist. I'm, I'm sure you uh, kiss your girls goodnight, Nikki. I'm, I'm sure you don't kiss Pancake goodnight, though. I'm, I'm pretty certain on that one. No, kiss my girls goodnight, kiss my dogs goodnight, but not Pancake. But not Pancake. Have a good weekend.